everybody. Uh, I am Mike Riley, Director of Parks for Montgomery Parks. Welcome to the uh, latest edition of the Park Speaker Series. Today we have Cracking the Spotted Lanternfly with our special guest, uh, Kenton uh, Sumter. Uh, the uh, Spotted Lanternfly is an invasive pest that's making its way across moment across the across the uh, uh, Maryland and in just a moment we're going to learn more about the insect and how we can all uh, help stop its spread uh, but before I introduce our speaker I'm going to go over a few uh, housekeeping notes the session uh, will be recorded and will be posted to the Montgomery Parks website for future viewing. So if you're enamored, you can watch it as many times as you want. And you can certainly tell your friends who didn't get to join us today that it's available to watch at their uh, convenience. It will be at montgomeryparks.org backslash speaker series. That's how you find it. So immediately following Kenton's uh, presentation, we're going to have a Q&A. You can submit your questions via the Q&A box throughout the session, and we'll try to address as many questions as possible uh, during the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, I don't presume all of you uh, who joined us today know about Montgomery Parks. Uh, we are part of a bi-county agency called the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Our agency does the planning and land use and zoning in both Montgomery and Prince George's County, and we also manage uh, the park system. Uh, we serve across the two counties about uh, 2 million residents of a very diverse uh, urban, suburban, and rural population. Uh, we have on the Montgomery side, we have uh, 421 parks, about 37,000 acres of land. About three quarters of that land is held in conservation. So we had a lot of work to do in the area of natural resource management and wildlife management. And these invasive pests are always of great interest to us in the park system as to how they will influence the ecosystem uh, in the park. So that brings us to today's topic, the spotted lanternfly and its impact on the state of Maryland and here in Montgomery County. The spotted lanternfly is a non-native invasive sap-eating insect that is considered a nuisance to humans and a threat to plants. Today, we're joined by Kenton Sumter, an entomologist with the Maryland Department of Agriculture's Plant Protection and Weed Management uh, Spotted Lanternfly Program. Kenton graduated from Frostburg State University with a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries and he holds a uh, master's degree in entomology from Virginia Tech, go Hokies. So with that, uh, please welcome our speaker today, Kenton Sumter. All righty, thank you very much, Mike. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, I'm Kenton Sumter and I am an entomologist of the Department of Agriculture. My sole responsibility is spotted lanternfly. So I'm gonna try and give you guys as much information as I can about this insect and uh, what the state is getting into uh, what some impacts are and what we can do to try and manage this insect. But um, if anybody has questions, I'm here to answer literally anything you could think of. Um, I'm going to speak to a number of different topics, <clears throat> excuse me, ranging from the current quarantine to the permitting requirements for um, businesses and um, also some kind of biological research that's going on into, um, into biocontrols and um, just kind of a number of different things. So if questions are sparked, ask them and I'm here to answer. But without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and open my screen up here and touch this thing off. And I think, there we go. Okay. So this is a spotted lanternfly, classic adult picture right there. Um, the spotted lanternfly, just to kind of give some background, beginning, um, this is an insect that will be fairly familiar to folks. Uh, this is a leafhopper. So if people are familiar with running around their yards, cutting the grass, and you see these tiny little triangular insects jumping out of the grass and pinging off of you, these are the exact same. Um, they are fairly large. Uh, they're about an inch long and an inch and a half wide when they're adults with their wings fully spread out. Um, the adults are a very classical uh, view, a very classical kind of picture. They've got a kind of buff colored wing with black polka dots and a lot of little digital markings, like very small black dashes at the uh, far distal um, uh, margins of their wings. And one of the big giveaways is that when they're in flight, 
the adults have these bright red hind wings. So that's one of the things I always tell people. If you're looking for the adults and you see bugs flying around, uh, look for that bright red hind wing and you might have seen a lanternfly. Otherwise, you might be looking at the grasshopper or a moth or something else. These insects come to us from uh, southern, I'm sorry, eastern Asia, um, primarily from southern China. Um, there are also portions of northeastern India that go and harbor lanternfly. And they've become invasive in a number of other countries. Um, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan in particular have had to deal with this insect for several years now. And a lot of the research generated from their uh, experiences is kind of what's informing what we're doing. But these insects are doing great in the States, unfortunately, um, even better than they're doing in their, um, their uh, East Asian ranges. Now, they've only got a single generation per year. This is somewhat helpful in the sense that they don't um, clone themselves the way that some other insects are capable of doing. They don't have multiple generations. So with just a single generation, they can slow them down a little bit and can also kind of hold at bay um, pesticide resistance. So we do use chemicals on these insects to go and control them in most instances. And um, this is something that will be more effective for longer if they don't have multiple generations per year. Now they have uh, four nymphal instars. I'm gonna show a next uh, slide that'll detail this more specifically. And they have a, a adult stage and then an egg mass stage. These insects go through what we're calling incomplete, I'm sorry, incomplete metamorphosis. And that means that when you're looking for them, it's just gonna be an egg, a nymph, and an adult. They don't pupate the way that a butterfly would. They don't go through complete metamorphosis. Um, they just kind of start off as tiny little bugs and they molt into bigger and bigger versions of themselves until they finally get to be an adult. They're also sexually dimorphic, which means that if you're curious, the males are smaller than the females. And especially when the females are mated and gravid, which means they have eggs, um, they're like much, much larger. You can see them much more obviously. Um, they've got bands of yellow along their abdomens that really stand out. Um, and uh, you know, those are kind of your high value insects. If you're looking for adults and looking to get those, um, those are the ones that are carrying the eggs uh, later in the season. Now, speaking to what I mentioned about the life cycle of these insects, right now we are in the hatch and first instar area. Um, these insects just started hatching as of last week, and they're probably still fairly cryptic. Um, they're very small. The first instars are about three millimeters across, and they kind of look like little tiny spiders. They're very like small abdomen, small body with long spindly legs. Um, they are black with white spots and kind of have a longish head, almost like a weevil. If anyone's familiar with what a weevil looks like, it's got kind of a, a stretched out head, um, but they're going to molt and get larger and larger. Uh, they're going to um, molt into the second and third instars as um, May turns into June, and they tend to get more and more visible as they get larger. They also have the widest feeding host range. So the insects are benefited when they're small by feeding on as many plants as they possibly can. Um, this means when they're the early instars, people tend to find them on their garden plants or on ornamentals, rose bushes, things like that. Um, and they will, as they get larger, start to retreat back to their host trees that they really like, especially the tree of heaven, which is the host that they're most strongly attracted to. But as babies, their competitiveness and their fitness is improved by feeding on a lot of different species. Now, once it gets into July, we'll start to see the fourth instars, and this is where they get large. They're about a half inch across at this point. Um, they get red markings. People start recognizing what they are. And um, then into July and August, the adults will molt. And that's what we're going to keep for the longest. So from August through the first frosts of November or December, um, we'll see the adults. And those are your big brown winged black polka dot red hind wing insects um, that are going to be, um, be, be such a nuisance. Um, they're going to start their swarming season in September and October. Uh, this is because their host, the tree of heaven, goes into senescence. It starts to go to sleep for the winter time and they start looking for other hosts to go to. So we see more insects flying around in September and October than we do um, in August and July. And um, they're looking for mates, they're looking for new hosts, um, they're looking for places to lay their eggs. And um, our reporting just goes through the roof. Once September and October hit, our reporting doubles. Uh, people are just seeing these insects all over the place. When they lay their egg masses, they're gonna be looking for just about any smooth vertical surface to go and lay on. Um, their host trees are the ones they really like. So they're tree of heaven and some other species I'll detail on the next slide, but um, they'll also lay them on man-made structures. So they'll lay them on buildings, fence posts, vehicles, trailers, um, rocks, construction materials. They can really lay them just about anywhere. And this contributes to their ability to spread. 
Um, they are very good hitchhikers or very bad hitchhikers, I guess, as you want to describe it uh, or think about it. But um, when the females are laying their eggs, they can hide them on cargo containers that are going down a rail line or getting shipped on a, on a ship somewhere. And, um, and they can find themselves wind, winding up in very distant locations. That's kind of what we're experiencing now with our spread is they've been, um, they've been hitchhiking and being inadvertently spread uh, very, very far. Now, behaviors, they are sap feeders. So they will take their proboscis and stick it into the cambium of a tree, suck out the photosynthate, you know, the sap, um, thus robbing that plant of, um, of carbohydrate and nutrients that it would otherwise sequester for the winter in its roots or contribute to its uh, fruit or leaves. And um, that's kind of the major, um, major deleterious effect on plants is that they're going to, um, to harm the plant's ability to store nutrients. They're primarily attracted to Tree of Heaven, Alanthus altissima. If folks aren't familiar with Tree of Heaven, it's another East Asian invasive species, um, very long established. It's been in the States for like 200 years. Um, these guys love it. I say let them fight. You know, it's unfortunate we have two invasive species, but if they're both feeding on each other, might as well. But um, it is one of the few species these insects will actually really cause harm to is Tree of Heaven. Um, there's reports of them actually killing Tree of Heaven or like stunting its growth fairly substantially. Um, they don't tend to have that outsized of an effect on other plants on which they feed, uh, which is good news. They're not killing trees or killing ornamentals or killing crops, um, but they are certainly still a source of very great stress for these plants. They have a number of secondary hosts. So uh, black walnut during the, the summer season is very popular. Um, wild and cultivated grape is extremely popular. Species of willow and Eastern white pine are also popular. And the maples, the silvers and the red maples, once September hits, the insects begin leaving Tree of Heaven and looking for, that's, sorry, um, they begin looking for uh, maple trees after they leave the Tree of Heaven and reds and silvers get to be very, very popular once, uh, once the uh, Tree of Heaven goes into senescence. Now they feed on a wide variety of plants. I always put in 70 as kind of a, a conservative estimate, but I believe the research is suggesting now it's um, 112 species of plant in North America. Um, this will feed in very directly to my recommendations for mitigation strategies um, because these insects feed on so many host plants, um, you're not going to eliminate them by getting rid of Tree of Heaven or by you know, just killing the ones you find in your yard. Um, they're established in the landscape. They have so many hosts, you're not going to eliminate them by, by robbing them of food sources. Um, they're always going to be able to find more. So it'll kind of inform what strategies um, a business or a public agency or even a private, private residence wants to undertake. Now, the impacts on these guys, there's a couple of different things going on. Um, the economy is the first one. So the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, the ones that have put out the most comprehensive economic impact uh, study of what lanternfly could potentially do. And the long and short of it is basically that there are hundreds of millions of dollars in damages uh, potentially from lanternfly's effects on orchards, nurseries, vineyards, and even forestry. Um, so that is kind of our, our stakes right now is that uh, the impact that lanternfly can have on our, um, our agro industry. The, um, the industry in particular that's really getting hit hard in Maryland is uh, vineyards and wineries and just small grape growers. Um, lanternfly are so strongly attracted to cultivated grapevines and have such an impact on those vines when they feed that grape growers are having to kind of change strategies uh, in terms of applying pesticides and even just caring for their vines uh, because these insects are so bad uh, in the way that they feed. We've also seen recently that the insects are suppressing photosynthesis in maple trees when they feed. Um, this makes me consider them a forest pest insect, as well as being um, an agricultural insect and a public nuisance, uh, which is the last thing I mentioned here. Uh, these insects live in the woods. They will um, overnight in the woods. They will lay their eggs in trees up high up in the canopies. They'll come down out of the trees to feed on whatever they want to feed on, especially for the vineyards. Um, but they'll retreat back up in the woodlots over the night. And um, we're not seeing a loss of trees or a die off of these um, wood, uh, wooded stands, but they're having um, some effect and they're such heavy feeders. I'm sure it's a bad uh, outcome for those trees. Now, the public nuisance is actually the one I think that's the most, uh, most high impact thing, especially for just Maryland residents. These insects get to be so dense in the areas where they are uh, infesting that people complain to me they can't go outside, that there are so many of these insects that folks um, have to shut down their pools because the insects will clog their pool filters. Um, they'll be sneaking in the front door. They'll just jump on you while you're trying to sit outside and enjoy an evening. And um, 
they will produce honeydew when they feed. It's just a sugary excretion from eating sap, but that honeydew will attract wasps and ants. Um, it'll encourage mold to grow. So if you've got a lanternfly squirting honeydew over your shed and there's mold growing over it now because the honeydew is sugar that's attracting native uh, naturally occurring molds, then you've got that to try and clean off. Um, and it could even kill photosynthetic materials. So if leaves or grass get that mold on it, they won't photosynthesize and they'll die. Um, trees in general aren't too badly affected by sooty mold, but lawns can definitely be destroyed by it. Um, so the public nuisance factor, I think, is almost one of the biggest things for lanternfly that Marylanders are concerned over. Um, the pictures that I've included here on this slide are of um, two locations. One is in uh, Pittsburgh, I'm sorry, Philadelphia at Temple University, and it shows uh, several hundred dead adult lanternfly laying on the ground where they've either you know, starved, run out of food, or maybe potentially been chemically treated. I think probably not because it's such a, an active public space, but it represents that these insects are active in heavily urbanized environments. Um, they infest all five boroughs in New York City. So urban or rural doesn't slow them down. It keeps auto advancing. Um, they're not slowed down. So they live in cities and they live in, um, in rural locations too. Uh, in Maryland, our most heavily impacted area right now is um, along the Susquehanna, around like Haverty Grace and Aberdeen, and then over in Hagerstown. Hagerstown City is heavily infested. Uh, the other picture I have is of a tree in Pennsylvania that's coated with thousands of lanternfly to the extent that it looks like it's just bark, like a living coating on the outside of this tree. And um, I've not seen it that bad, but I've seen it almost that bad. And um, it's really something to see. Now, grape is uh, one of the most heavily impacted commodities that we're looking at, and it informs what we are doing as the state for our suppression efforts. Um, the slide details a number of different things. Basically, when lanternfly feed on grape, it is robbing the grape's ability to store nutrients and sequester uh, carbs for carbohydrate yeah, for um, overwintering. That's the biggest one. So there is evidence in Pennsylvania that old vines or poorly maintained vines can be killed by lanternfly feeding uh, over the winter time. Also that the yield of grapes may be reduced. And what we're seeing in Maryland that our growers have reported is that the amount of chemical they have to use to go and keep their vines clear is increased. They have to spray regularly to kill these bugs and that the actual physical integrity of their vines is reduced, that um, they're seeing a lot more um, follow on damage even just from pruning or interacting with the vines uh, because they're being weakened by lanternfly feeding. Um, so that's, that's some pretty, pretty obvious things that these lanternfly are doing to our, our vineyards. The magic number seems to be about eight adults feeding on a vine uh, when we start seeing major carbon limitations being imposed on, um, on these grapes. And, um, and yeah, that's just kind of the, the, the nitty gritty of impacts on grape vines. Now this next slide I'm looking at is um, a, a wide distribution map for the entire invasion of the Eastern United States. Um, this is something put on by the New York State um, IPM, New York State Integrated Pest Management, and they have got information from all the other participating states and put it into one big map detailing where lanternfly infestations occur, where hitchhikers have been found, and where states have imposed their quarantines. So this map is encompassing basically the entire Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we've got infestations in every state in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, we have infestations in New England and Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, Let's see, I think where we have uh, Massachusetts, yeah, has infestations as well. And um, we have it out into the Great Lakes in Ohio and Michigan, and um, even down into uh, North Carolina, we have small infestations. These um, quarantines, unfortunately for Maryland, that's not represented correctly. I need to actually go and get that changed for them. I need to go and message uh, New York and tell them our quarantine has expanded, which is the next slide that I'll show. But I recommend this map for anybody that's interested in seeing the extent of the invasion um, it's updated regularly by New York and um, is a really good resource for just seeing where lanternfly is in the United States. Now, this is one of the most important slides that I have to go and show. This is the current quarantine map for Maryland. It had been initially last year um, only, let's see, we added seven counties, we're at 18, so um, 11 counties we had in the quarantine prior to uh, this year. And um, the reason we go and expand this is because we discovered new infestations. Lanternfly is getting transported um, inadvertently on uh, shipping and cars and, um, and rail lines, and it is finding its way to new locations. So we expand the boundaries of this quarantine, hoping to um, educate Marylanders on uh, good sanitary practices and get businesses and uh, public agencies 
contributing to the, or participating in rather, our permitting program. Um, this also indicates where we want to go for our outreach, um, where we want to go and host educational events and even just send physical outreach materials to, um, and also uh, gives us more powers for surveys. So we can enter properties, um, look for these insects, and have a bit more in the way of, of regulatory teeth to go and do it. Um, I'm going to detail a little bit later what the uh, conditions of the permits are specifically, but broadly speaking, what businesses and public agencies need to understand for their operations inside of a quarantine is that if you are transporting regulated articles, uh, which are classified in the quarantine order, um, if you're transporting regulated articles from or within the quarantine, you need to have a permit. And um, that is uh, fairly fairly painless. It is some more work that needs to be done, but it has some conditions to it that require inspections of those regulated articles, uh, maintenance of inspection records, and um, uh, some training that needs to be undertaken. We're not going to be addressing this quarantine again this year. Um, we expand at the start of each year once we take a stock of how far Lanternfly has expanded. Um, I bet it will keep on moving, but at this point we're looking at 18 counties in the quarantine. That's a majority of Maryland counties. Uh, the very furthest reaches of the state may not be the most hospitable areas for lanternflies. I'm hoping they're largely um, not bothered, but um, you know, time will tell as we do our surveys this year. This is a bit of an outlook for this next map is a bit of an outlook for where lanternfly fall in terms of their density in the state. The red counties, which is pretty much Allegheny across the northern part of the state and down through Kent and Queen Anne's, um, are heavily infested. Um, they're areas that have large, well-established populations that we really wouldn't be able to fully suppress. They've, they've been established now for several years. The yellow counties are included kind of in the central part of the state, so Montgomery, Prince George's, Anne Arundel, um, and then over the bay in Talbot, Caroline, and Wicomico are fairly lightly infested. They have hitchhikers that have been reported over the last year and very small uh, localized infestations that we're hoping we can kind of get um, a bit of headway on um, as, uh, as the year progresses. And then our green counties, the very tips of far western in Garrett, and then far southern in Charles, St. Mary's, Calvert, Dorchester, Somerset, and Worcester counties, um, really don't have any established populations. We've not found every single life stage represented, so we can't say that lanternfly are reproducing for sure. Um, but again, time will tell, and we will do surveys to find out more. The next series of map, maps I'm going to go through are detailing the kind of um, infestation path from last year. This is based upon reporting through our survey that Marylanders have been contributing to. Uh, it's accessible online, and I'll actually go and show a screen grab of what it looks like on our website. But this is a really cool system. Uh, we started doing this in 2021, and it lets Marylanders report where they're finding lantern fly, how many, under what conditions, and is a good way of tracking where the infestation is going, and also kind of informs how we do some of our surveys. Although we are moving away from our model previously of just replying to every single complaint and instead doing a bit more of a targeted um, kind of industry-based or risk-based uh, survey and treatment method. But starting off last year, January through to May, um, we have a pretty obvious spread of where our historic heavily infested areas are. So the most reports we have of, um, of egg masses and early instar hatching is gonna be in Hagerstown and then in Harford County, kind of between, um, well, a little bit of Cecil too, between Perryville and Haverty Grace, um, and over towards Aberdeen, pretty much traveling down I-95. Um, Hagerstown is just throughout the city. Um, it got well established in the last two years, so it's kind of in all the neighborhoods, along the parks, in the rail lines, just everywhere. We also have some discoveries in a few older satellites in central Baltimore, around Pretty Boy, um, and down in Sykesville, um, across um, Carroll and Howard counties. And there's some very far-flung, um, uh, uh, I think actually misidentifications in, um, I believe that's Anne Arundel, and then out in Assateague. They thought they'd found one, um, but it was never positively identified. In June, we start to see the um, second and third instars hatching out, and I think even molting into fourth instars. It becomes much more obvious how these insects are distributed. We see the pretty much the entirety of Harford County um, and Cecil County now represented with um, discoveries. Hagerstown and a large majority of central Washington County now have discoveries of fourth instar insects. We see uh, Carroll and parts of eastern Frederick counties finding more discoveries, especially in old infested sites around New Windsor. Um, these are, are satellites that were established last year. Um, and then um, going down to Kent County, we have some old established areas there. 
reporting in Kent and Queen Anne's, um, the rural Eastern Shore counties is more difficult. Uh, they're just fewer people, more widely spread, so they don't tend to catch lanternflies early. In July, this is when we start seeing four thin stars and maybe even a few adults, um, heavy infestations, basically all of Hartford, Cecil, Baltimore, Washington, um, even Baltimore City are all fully involved with lanternfly. People are finding them all over the place. Our old satellites are growing in the central part of the state and we get um, hitchhikers now, I'm sorry, not even hitchhikers now, we're getting discoveries of lanternfly in Allegheny County for the first time getting positive IDs in Allegheny, out in Cumberland and um, in Rocky Gap. Now in August, we've got our adults. Um, it just continues. Basically now we've got heavy infestations throughout Baltimore, Carroll, uh, Frederick, Washington, all the way down through Kent. Um, pretty much the northern half of the state is fully involved. Um, unfortunately, Cumberland City really took off last year too. So we have a, a fully involved infestation in Cumberland City now. We've got hitchhikers that have been discovered in pretty far flung locations for us because we're in Annapolis, um, but we've got discoveries in McHenry and Salisbury. Uh, which are troubling because from the office, it's about two and a half hours to each of those sites. So uh, we are trying to figure out good ways to um, to go and uh, conduct surveys and treatments that far out. Uh, but we try and investigate all of these satellites. In September, we start to see the beginning of swarming. So we have adults. Um, Tree of Heaven is just beginning to go into senescence by the end of the month. People are reporting more lanternfly than they've ever seen. It's basically a blizzard of red dots from Washington County across through Cecil County. Um, in October, Reporting continues, swarming continues. Um, what you can really see distinctly here too is a fairly obvious spread of lanternfly going down the I-270 corridor in Montgomery County. Um, it's following a adjacent rail line as well. I believe it's a CSX and I think Amtrak going down along the interstate. And um, it is uh, just a transportation pathway. That's how these insects move. Um, we've only heavily discovered lanternfly in two locations in Montgomery County at this point. Um, Laytonsville has a population and Seneca Creek State Park has a population as well. Seneca is very light. Um, we've been talking with them about mitigation strategies. Um, Laytonsville, we actually did removals as well. And I believe removed, I want to say it's about 180 egg masses over this last winter, um, which is a, a fair chunk of insects for a small infestation. It's about 30 bugs per egg mass. Um, but um, we are keeping our eye on it and trying to go and run down as many of these satellites as we can. November reporting begins to fall off because ideally we're getting some cold weather at this point. The insects have laid their eggs and they're starting to lose their energy. And then in December, reporting's basically done. And this is what um, lanternflies infestation looks like in Maryland, according to Marylanders, what they've been reporting. Um, it's a blizzard <laughs> basically from Washington across to uh, Cecil. It's just a solid mass of red dots, um, a little bait break for Catoctin Mountain there in Lake Frederick County, I think. Um, Cumberland's fully involved. And uh, we've got many, many um, uh, hitchhikers that have been reported in the southern part of the counties going towards like Charles and Calvert. Um, PG picked up an infestation very lightly and um, more, you know, far flung hitchhikers showing up at Ocean City that have to run out and try and account for it too. Now there's a couple of different methods we use for ascertaining where lanternfly is and what we want to go and do with it. So for the state, we do trapping. Um, this is our first means of early detection. We do not use traps as a mitigation tool. We will put these up in areas we think lanternfly might be moving towards um, or might be present in, but we just haven't found them yet. We have to find host trees, usually it means tree of heaven, um, because there is no lure for lanternfly. There's no artificial attractor for them. So we have to find the places where we think they're going to go, put these traps up on the tree and see if we catch them. Uh, the trap itself is actually commercially available. It's called a circle trap. It's uh, just a little bit of mesh that kind of forms a funnel. You staple it to a tree. There's a bag on top. And um, the bugs just naturally, as they wander up and down the tree trunks, will get inside of the bags and die. Um, it's nice because it's fairly specific to tree insects. Um, you run less of a risk of birds and mammals and things getting stuck on your traps, as opposed to using an a, um, adhesive trap, like a sticky band. Um, I always recommend traps for residents and for businesses or public agencies. Um, they're very good for catching insects without doing a lot of effort. Um, if you don't want to go out there and squish them by hand, um, especially if you don't want to use chemicals, you can just place these traps and get some passive management uh, without needing to be super physically active. Just check those bags every so often, empty them out, clean them up, and reattach them. Uh, Penn State uh, Extension also puts out a good DIY, do-it-yourself trap, um, which you can just construct. They've got a list of construction materials, put it together yourself, and um, you know, ideally maybe that's a little cheaper than buying one of these things. 
but um, the company that sells them, I believe, sells them for $18 per trap, which you only need one on a tree. And I think the closest trapping schedule is like 20 meters apart. So most people don't have that many trees that close together. Um, for your property, you might need one or two traps uh, to start really making an impact on these insects. Adhesive bands are useful, but what I only recommend for these is that you do it early in the season. So like right now, basically in the next month, um, the nymphs are really terrible climbers. They'll uh, hatch out of their eggs, they'll be on their trees, they like their host trees, and they're really terrible at climbing, so they'll fall off constantly and they have to climb back up the tree. So adhesive bands placed low on the trunk can catch a lot of nymphs. Um, you want to check it regularly. You don't want birds and lizards and, and mice getting stuck to your bands, but um, you can mitigate that a little bit by using something like bug barrier, where the adhesive is actually on the interior side of the, um, of the band. And there's some cotton batting to like keep stuff from falling down inside of it and give the trap something to stick to. And um, you can kind of limit your impact if you use something like in this picture, which is a, um, uh, again, a band with the adhesive side on the interior. Uh, so the bugs will wander up inside of it and get stuck. But um, I'd recommend that primarily for nymphs early in the season and not so much for adults. Um, they, uh, they tend to move around a lot and aren't so susceptible to that. This picture is just a URL, a link for the Penn State DIY trap. If anybody were just to circle, I'm sorry, search um, DIY circle trap or Penn State DIY circle trap, you'd find this. Um, lots of people on YouTube also making up traps. Now, once we get trapped, we find out there's some bugs around or we have some, some worries there are bugs in that area, we'll do surveys. We'll go out to a point of interest, we'll set up a buffer around that interest and we'll just look for host tree species. We'll look for signs of lanternfly feeding like honeydew raining out of a tree, um, carcasses of the insects themselves, the actual insects on a tree, um, or extra stinging bugs, you know, bees and wasps um, buzzing around an area eating that honeydew. And um, we'll make note of it. We'll kind of, um, you know, ascertain where all the, the tree of heaven is because that's primarily what we're looking for. And then um, we'll also make contact with residents to let them know that we're in the area. Frequently, what we try and do is gain permission to go and enter properties. So we'll send out a series of letters notifying residents that we want to come to their properties and do surveys. If we don't receive any yes or no's, we are empowered by the order, uh, the quarantine order to enter a property and just look for the bugs. Um, so if you see us around, it could have been you got a letter, maybe, you know, check your mail. Um, if you got a couple letters, it'll let you know our advancing date when we're going to be getting there. Um, previously, we'd respond to every single complaint that we could, but that's just too many. So now we, uh, we kind of um, just target it a bit more specifically based upon a couple of um, a couple of different variables, namely sightings outside the quarantine in new counties, proximity to at-risk agriculture, and far-flung um, infestations within counties. Now, oh, I got to move on. I got 15 minutes. Um, treatment that we have, um, there's three main ones. Mechanical, broadly put, kill them by hand. Chemical, chemical alternatives. And then cultural is going to be cultivating your, uh, your environment, so removing host species. Of all these, what I really recommend, especially for residents, is going to be mechanical removals. Um, it's going to keep you safe from chemicals. It's going to keep the environment safe from chemicals. And you can still gain some level of management on lanternfly, especially if you're destroying egg masses over the winter. You can really gain um, some progress or some, um, some lead on the infestation by destroying egg masses. Um, look for host trees where the insects have hung out. Um, keep an eye on vertical flat surfaces where they might lay their eggs and crush them. We use paint rollers for ourselves with a roller head removed and a pole and just reach up in the tree and squish them with that. Um, we used to say scrape them. We're not saying scrape anymore. Just get something you can roll over top of the egg mass. It'll crackle and pop and crush. And that's how you know you've got them. For chemical alternatives, I would really only recommend this if you are a business trying to protect a product. Um, these insects aren't going to be managed by chemicals. It's not going to end the, uh, the infestation. Um, if you need to keep them off of, say, a crop that you're growing, then spraying contact insecticides is something you might have to do. Um, systemics are an option for folks that might want to go and treat tree of heaven to systematize it with a chemical um, and create what we call a trap tree. So the insects are attracted to it and maybe killed. Um, we only apply insecticides, I'm sorry, systemic um, pesticide to tree of heaven. Um, we do not treat any native species. And um, we also wait till tree of heaven is done flowering. So we don't want to go and harm our pollinators. Um, I would recommend that. Please do not apply systemics to native tree species. Um, and if you're going to use a contact insecticide, um, only apply it to concentrations of lanternflies. Don't just do boundary sprays because um, you can kill, you're going to kill the good bugs with the bad bugs. Um, the issue of bioaccumulation is going to be there in the environment for uh, you know predators eating those contaminated carcasses. 
and um, and you'll expose yourself to potentially to uh, to drift and exposure to those chemicals. Now, our treatments, just to kind of blow through this page a little bit, we are only really treating vineyards um, or other at-risk agriculture. Um, we just don't have the capabilities to go after uh, residents or even do large-scale business treatments unless it's just such a high risk and the problem is so bad. Uh, maybe then we can try and organize something. Now, for us in our treatments, um, we did some stuff in 2022. Uh, we were doing chemical sprays targeted at the transportation industry. We've since shifted to agriculture. Um, these are just some rough numbers. We mixed about 53 gallons worth of uh, mix to go and apply to these insects, treated about 40 properties. Um, we're hoping to do more this year. And we also were applying a dormant oil to the egg masses, giving that a test run last year. Killed about 4,000 egg masses, mostly in Williamsport over in um, Washington County doing that. Um, this last winter, we've done more in the way of egg mass removals. So over winter 2022, 2023, um, we've been physically destroying egg masses, mostly in Baltimore County, mostly in vineyards. Um, but this number is actually a little low now. It's actually up to 35,000 egg masses that were destroyed. Um, so that's about a million insects that we eliminated from the state um, over the course of the winter time. Uh, it's pretty good. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. So we, um, we're going to keep working on it. Um, we're moving on to uh, backpack vacuums now uh, while we have our, our plants flowering. Um, and then we'll move to chemical treatments after July. Um, we also tried to go and go you know, after places that are particular high risk, uh, namely our far, far flung infestations in Wicomico County and around BWI. We're really worried about bugs getting out uh, on the airplanes, so we keep an eye on that. We're also getting our outreach really pushed strongly. So this is something you guys might see from us. Presentations here are one of them, but also you might see ads online that we're trying to uh, build interest. We have a lot of outreach materials we're always willing to send out to public interest groups, businesses. Um, just any agency that has uh, any kind of outreach bent to it. Um, we want to get the word out about Lanternfly. So we're willing to make appearances, um, deliver merchandise, things like that. Um, we also are delivering outreach uh, to uh, businesses in the form of mail. Um, we're sending out mailers to update businesses about permits, um, just to get people on board with our permitting system. Um, we're really trying to do it all. This is just an example of a billboard that we had to put up one on Route 50. It says, see a spot of lanternfly? Stomp, report, um, and then a big picture of a lanternfly and a link to our URL. Um, we're just trying to get the word out there. So billboards are a good way of doing that, especially on a busy, uh, busy road like Route 50 going out towards Ocean City. This picture is just a, uh, a bit of the merchandise that we have. We've got pens, pencils, um, bottle openers, uh, those little silicon bottle openers, cleaning rags for screens, stress foam, squeezy bugs in the shape of a big lanternfly adult. Um, this is just kind of an example of some of the things that we could send uh, to your organization for uh, lanternfly outreach. Now, our digital ad campaign actually went really well. So this is our geofencing. We um, It's the first time doing ads. Uh, we reached about a million people, a million impressions over the summertime. Uh, another 30,000 people came back to us, physically clicked through to our website following those ads. Really great turnaround. Um, I think that's something we're going to try and do again. So you might see our ads popping up here over the course of summertime. Um, and you might see us online too with our egg mass ads. Um, this will take you to our website where you could do survey reports, find out information about lanternfly, and um, just kind of generally keep yourself educated in the loop. Now this comes to our surveys. This is the big one. So if people are gonna report where they're finding spotted lanternfly, um, please come to the website, please do your surveys um, or do your reports on our survey and reserve the email or uh, the phone lines for complaints and questions. We get so many responses through phone, email, and online that um, we just can't respond to them all. And we're supposed to respond to every phone call and email that we get. Um, we had 11,500 responses in our survey last year um, and about, I think, 4,000 emails and phone calls. So it's just too many. <laughs> we can't do it. So if you find Lanternfly, report it on the survey. If you have a question, email us. Um, we can't respond to questions on the survey. But you come to our website, click on this big link right here, It'll take you to the survey page and you can report what you found, um, give us some information about who you are, if you found it. Um, you do have to have a photograph. We have a little bit of quality control. We need a photograph just so we know that you're looking at Spotted Lanternfly. Yeah, this is lots of emails, lots of phone calls, lots of survey records. It's not taken off quite yet this year, but I'm sure it's going to blow up. Um, yeah, just for reference, our don't bug email was 2,700 responses, phone calls were 1,700 phone calls, and 11,500 responses in our online survey. Now permitting, this is gonna be one of the most important things I talk about in addition to the boundaries of the quarantine. 
This applies to uh, majorly to businesses in Maryland, but also to public agencies too. Um, anybody doing business in uh, Maryland who is moving a transported, I'm sorry, who's transporting a regulated article from or within the quarantine area needs to get a permit. A regulated article can be a lot of things, um, hauling things like construction materials, nursery materials, um, yeah, just anything that you could be hauling along with you, um, in addition to vehicles, conveyances. So cars, trucks, trailers, vans, um, all that kind of stuff are classified as regulated articles. So if you are a business, you may think that you are not, um, not required to go and get a permit, but if you're owning and operating fleet vehicles, moving around doing your, um, your business, then you need to get a permit because you have a vehicle that you're using for business within the quarantine um, and it is potentially a vector for spotted lanternfly. You can find the link here on the right-hand side of the screen circled in red. Um, only a single representative from a business or an agency needs to go and follow this. That person will be our designated spotted lanternfly person. They take the training. It's like an hour, I think at most. Um, it's a video with a, a short test at the end, free. Um, and then once you successfully pass that test, we'll send you a permit. And it is expected then that that person will be training their coworkers on lanternfly identification and mitigation. And it's we call it train the trainer. But ideally, then you guys are going to be looking for it, um, going over your vehicles, going over anything that's being transported that's not like packaged inside a safe area. If it's exposed to lanternfly, it sits on the ground, it could be invested, it should be inspected. Um, we want records of those inspections kept. So just something there, a little documentation that says, this item was inspected on this day, found this many lanternfly, and this is what I did to them. And just hang on to that for two years. And, um, and the permit needs to be displayed in every business location. So just your main office is good. If you're a contractor working out of your house, keep it in your house, that's fine. Um, and then ideally keep a copy of the permit in a vehicle, so like in the glove box, just something there. So we know that, um, that somebody knows about lanternfly and somebody has been doing permit training. Um, and then yeah, scour the lanternfly off, just try not to spread them. Um, sanitary vehicles, sanitary articles are what's gonna slow down the spread and keep it from getting to new locations. Um, there's no recertification period. So once you get it, you're good. We just ask that if a person leaves their position, who's the designated lanternfly person, just have someone new come on board take the training so we know who to contact. Um, but yeah, once you get it, it's free and, um, and you're good to go forever. Um, there is a civil penalty that can be applied. So if there is a series of violations, that's something we can talk about, but I really don't want to give the impression that we're painting a target on people's backs by um, encouraging permitting. We want to work with businesses and agencies to get rid of lanternfly, not to just issue fines. Um, that's not what we're here for. So don't feel like you're, you're in someone's sites because you got a permit. Um, please get a permit. Please look for bugs. Please keep a record of it. Now, in 2023, basically, this is just going to be more bugs. That's the gist of this. The state is working on ag, working on vineyards, and then there's just going to be more insects. People are going to have to learn to get um, get along with lanternfly until the outbreak levels begin to reduce. Um, there's some indications that historic outbreaks in Pennsylvania and the far eastern PA around Philly are getting lighter. We don't know exactly why. Um, maybe pressure from native predators, native pests are working on lanternfly. They could be degrading their food sources. So they're just kind of running out of good food. Um, there's some indications in Cecil that uh, a population is starting to fall off. So fingers crossed that areas like Haverty Grace and Washington, uh, Hagerstown are gonna see some relief in the next year or two here. Um, but it's gonna be a thing we have to put up with them for a bit longer. Um, I imagine there'll be analogous to stink bugs where we see big fluctuations in population. So you'll get an outbreak year, they'll crash the next year. Um, and it's gonna be that, they're gonna be here forever. So with my last few minutes here, I just wanna go through some of the biocontrol work that's been going on. Um, biocontrol is the gold standard for controlling any pest, really be it plant <laughs> or bug or, uh, or other animal. Uh, we want something that is going to uh, target specifically that pest and go after it. And um, what they've been working with so far, unfortunately, hasn't borne a lot of fruit yet, but it's early days. Biocontrols can take literally a decade or more to even really begin getting a handle on. Um, the very first insect here, these are all parasitoid wasps. Um, so they lay their eggs inside of a, um, lay their eggs inside of a lanternfly, and then it will uh, grow and, and destroy that lanternfly. Uh, the host does not survive. Um, so the first ones, they actually had imported a good destroy spongy moth back in the early, um, you know, early 20th century. Um, 
not to a huge degree. They're not specific to lanternfly, but they're working on them. The other two have difficulties being raised in captivity. Uh, we've not been able to raise them to any substantial populations in um, lab environments. And there's some difficulties we're having getting them to sync with lanternfly uh, life cycles in the states. Um, so the anastatus is an egg parasitoid and uh, the dryness is a nymphal parasitoid. If we can get them to work, that'd be really cool, but it's a ways off. So it's um, it's just kind of something that we're still looking at. If anyone's interested too, um, I always recommend going to uh, stopslf.org. Um, there's a page there uh, that has all the current research that's been conducted on spotted lanternfly. Um, and there's a lot of this biocontrol research that's done. It's publicly available. Um, it can be an interesting read for folks that are, are, are scientifically minded and want to know what specifically has been done. This is also kind of neat too. This is the uh, entomopathogenic fungus that has been uh, kind of exposed to lanternfly. Um, entomopathogenic means bug killing, a bug pathogen. And um, we've got a few here. So Bavaria bassiana is the one that has been uh, the most active and has been shown to be the most lethal. It is uh, little cotton balls, basically. If you see a, a lanternfly with little white cotton balls on it, that's probably Bavaria. It is naturally occurring. Um, it is also available as a biopesticide. So it's something that I think you can purchase from like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or just a garden supply store. Um, it's another option for a non-synthetic chemical um, contact insecticide. It doesn't have a long residual period, it doesn't tend to stick around very long, but it's an option if you want to kill lanternfly and um, and not spray like pyrethroids or something. Um, it's not specific though, so you will kill other bugs. Uh, anything that's susceptible to Bavaria will um, will get killed by it. Uh, the other ones, the cordyceps and the metarhizium, just don't occur naturally um, in great quantities enough, we think, to go and really have an impact on lanternfly. And the batcoa just doesn't make the right spores. And once it gets on a lanternfly and gets going, it just won't reproduce the way that um, we need for it to maintain a population. Um, but that said though, if you have lantern fire discovering that have weird looking things growing out of them, uh, snap a picture and email it to us, hold on to the insect. Um, there was work going on at, um, I wanna say Cornell, I think, looking at entomopathogens. And I believe there's also some work going on with the University of Maryland who are looking at entomopathogens. So it's always worth holding on to um, and, you know, put it in some 75% alcohol and send it to us and we'll um, maybe send it along the way to the scientists and see what they say. There's also native predators. So this is cool too. Um, this is one of the big reasons I don't recommend people go and spray chemicals is because there's a lot of good bugs working on spotted lanternfly. Spiders, especially big garden spiders, will eat lanternfly. Wheel bugs, predatory stink bugs are all good for eating lanternfly and praying mantises are good for going after lanternfly. I know when I've done my sprays, I've seen these insects, all of them, and our, our hackneds eating lanternflies. Um, we don't want to kill the good bugs when we're trying to go after the bad bugs. So that's why I say be judicious with your chemicals. Um, really you know, avoid using them as a first uh, recourse to for lanternfly. Um, birds will also eat lanternfly. They, um, big insectivorous birds, um, also like chickens, domesticated birds, will go after lanternfly. So apparently, like, get some guinea hens and apparently they'll go after lanternfly pretty okay. Of interesting note, and I'm, I'm just starting to wrap up here, of interesting note is that, excuse me, hmm, is that the way the lanternfly are feeding on Tree of Heaven, we're thinking they actually are deriving a metabolite from it that is making them um, uh, un, uh, distasteful to feed on. So um, there is some indications that they like to feed on plants where the metabolites, those plants in their bodies make them like kind of nasty to taste, um, but that does not mean that they are toxic to feed on. Um, they don't transmit diseases, they don't sting, they don't bite. Um, people have reported lanternfly, um, or their pets rather, I'm sorry, like dogs, vomiting after eating lanternfly. But mostly what we've been told is that that's because uh, exoskeleton and chitin is really hard to digest. So it's the same as if they were eating a lot of like cicadas. They get a big belly full of that, you know, um, almost indigestible chitin and they just get a tummy ache and poop, uh, barf it back up. Um, the only thing I would want to remind people is that if your pets are eating insects, they are wild animals, and insects are very notorious for carrying a lot of parasites, um, a lot of a lot of worms and things like that. Um, so you want to just be regular with your pets' uh, visits to the vets. If they're eating cicadas or stink bugs or spotted lanternfly, um, they definitely oh sorry, they definitely want to maintain some good uh, health for your pets. And the very last slide here: How can you help? Um, first off, familiarize yourself with spotted lanternfly. 
I've got every major life stage represented here on the, um, the slide. I've got egg masses. The egg masses, the thing you want to look out for on the trees that these insects are infesting are these patches of gray mud, about the same size in adults, about an inch long, uh, about an inch wide, and they look like gray splotches of mud. That's actually a wax coating that's going over the eggs, um, and the eggs are underneath. So if you see those on, say, Tree of Heaven or a maple or a fence post, you just get something, crush it, you'll hear it pop and crush, and it'll be all juicy and goopy. Um, those are the egg masses. The little nymphs, remember, are very small. They'll get a little bigger. They grow up to be a, a half inch uh, wide, but right now they're very tiny, three millimeters across. They're black with white dots, and they're very spidery. When they get bigger later in July, they'll get red. They'll be about a half an inch wide. And then finally, once they molt into adults at the end of July and into August, they'll be an inch long, brown with black polka dot wings and a bright red hind wing. Um, look for them on Tree of Heaven. That's the biggest one, but you can also find them on grapes, black walnuts, maples, and pines. Um, and then also just flying all over the place around buildings. Report your sightings. When you find them, let us know about it. Report it online. Destroy them wherever you encounter them. If you're outside the quarantine, go ahead and hold on to your insect and let us know. Uh, we have to get voucher specimens for each county that's new. Um, and then the very last thing is if it's pertinent to you, get permitted. And honestly, if you want to get permitted, get permitted. It doesn't bother us if private residents, um, public agencies, nonprofits, whoever wants to go and do it, um, get your permits. And it's a good educational tool and never goes bad. So it's always something worth doing. And just to wrap up, I need to change this URL because it's so long and terrible, but this is us. Um, what I recommend if folks are looking for us, search MDA spotted lanternfly. That's an easy way to get us. Um, you can also do mda.maryland.gov forward slash spotted lanternfly. That's a way better URL. Um, email us at don'tbug.md at maryland.gov. And you can also call us at the phone number listed here. This is our general plant protection office number and you'll be directed to spotted lanternfly. But um, that's it then. This is Spotted Lanternfly uh, in Maryland for 2023. Um, I will hope take any questions right now if people have any. And yeah, um, yeah thank you so much for having me, everybody. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for that. Uh, my name is Darren Fluche. I'm the Division Chief for Park Planning and Stewardship, and I have the pleasure of facilitating the Q&A. Uh, we have about seven minutes left until the noon hour, and we have so far seven questions. So normally, I encourage people to submit questions, and I will do that. Please do submit questions, uh, but please uh, note that we have um, we, we won't be able to possibly get through any if uh, all of them if many come flooding in now. But please do. Uh, we we'll probably have time for a few more than what we have right now. So, uh, Kevin, thank you again so much for that. Um, the first question is a standard one we always get, which is: There's so much information here. Will will this PowerPoint be available? Uh, could you share the uh, the PDF with with us so that we can share with people that registered today. Is that something that would be possible? Yeah, I imagine it will be. As always, I check with my PIO just to make sure. But yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I'll stay in contact with you. And um, I'd like to be able to make this available for folks. But um, I always got to check. So I yeah. will say a qualified yes. <laughs> okay. So if it's if it's possible, we will, we will send it out. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, a couple of these I'm just going to read uh, straight. Um, the first. Uh, question is, I live about 10 miles northeast of uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in Lower Paxton Township. Last year, there were three trees of heaven adjacent to my deck, and the spotted lantern flying literally covered my deck every day. And this was this question came in before you talked about treatment. Spraying the deck every morning with home defense uh, seemed to be effect, more effective than soapy water for instant killing, but that gets expensive. Any advice? This, this year, the old trees appear dead, as they are black and thus far leafless, they have relatively narrow trunks. Uh, can I simply cut them down safely? Uh, how can I minimize the spread of spores? How do I keep them from returning? And can you share your power? Gotcha. Yeah, so just a quick rundown of that. Um, first off, always, I'm assuming home defense is a um, just a contact insecticide. Do be careful with applications at um, around your house. Um, it may not be labeled for that. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, just you keep yourself safe doing that. I imagine if it is a, uh, a chemically active insecticide, it's gonna be way more effective than soapy water. Um, the soapy stuff is good for the earlier life stages. Um, this is also true if you wanna go and use 
um, tools like horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps, or even neem oil. Um, they tend to be more effective against the nymphs than they are against the adults. Um, if you wanna use the, the detergent option, um, it's a 50-50 mix. So it's a really goopy mixture. Um, it's not just like a tablespoon in a gallon of water. It's gonna be like a cup of detergent, liquid detergent, and a cup of water mixed together. Um, it's really gonna make kind of a mess. And the idea is that you're gonna be uh, suffocating these insects. You're actually blocking their, um, their trachea to, to breathe. Um, but yeah, I imagine if you actually wanna go and apply an insecticide, it's probably gonna be more effective than, um, than a suffocant. Um, as far as your tree of heaven goes, I wouldn't be surprised if they were small stems and heavily, heavily fed on, then they could very well be dead. Um, I've seen tree of heaven around here starting to leaf out. So if you don't have any leaves yet, uh, they may not survive. They could be sending up little shoots from their roots though, if the roots have lived. So that's what I would keep an eye on. Um, if you cut down the larger stems, you might just still be struggling with the smaller like thicket of, of baby tree of heaven um, that will start growing from the roots. So it might mean that you need to do some mechanical removals for a bit, um, heavy mulching, um, or even if you can, if you don't have leaves, it makes it tough. There is a method called hack and squirt for removing tree of heaven, but you kind of need a live tree to do it because you hack the tree and apply an herbicide and it needs um, active transport to move the chemical down to the roots to kill it. Um, but if the trees are dead up top, there's no, no movement. So I would say probably the trees may be dead. I would say you could probably cut them down. Um, but you might be looking at some, some work until uh, all the, the roots are finally dead. Um, luckily, a tree of heaven seed bank only lasts about two years, even though there could be like thousands and thousands of seeds, um, they shouldn't persist for too long um, if you get rid of all the, the seed producing females. Um, let's see, cut them down, you, yeah, minimize yeah. spread of spores. Um, if you're talking about seeds, it's a matter of um, eliminating the female trees because they just produce so many. Um, if you're talking about like mold, the sooty mold grows naturally. There's no real way you can re reduce that. Um, just fewer lanternfly feeding means fewer food and keep them from returning. Um, if again, if that's tree of heaven, I would say you're looking at uh, mechanical removals, herbicide for little trees, or just like heavy, heavy mulching to try and keep them from coming up. Thanks, Ted. Um, going back to the slide where you talked about the quarantine counties, can you define uh, quarantine for us? Sure. So really specifically, the quarantine is for the transport of regulated articles. Um, I know if folks may be familiar with how the um, spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, um, how that was done by the federal government back in the day, where there were actually inspections by, um, by federal agents to go and see if you were transporting, you know, wood with a spongy moth egg mass on it. Um, the quarantine isn't for, um, for like stopping and inspecting more so as it is the quarantine is trying to regulate the movement of regulated articles. Um, and it is bound by areas where we're discovering um, established lanternfly infestations. So it is, um, I guess, trying to think of another way to kind of describe it. Basically, it's just there to try and slow down the spread of lanternfly by encouraging people to inspect the things they're moving the lanternfly could be on. And quarantine is the term that, that has right. been settled on for that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try and sneak two questions in really quick. One is, do you recommend people proactively take down trees of heaven if they have them in their yards, even if they're the only source of shade in that yard? Um, and do you anticipate uh, the mild winter may have uh, effects on the spread and increase of numbers? In yeah, so for tree of heaven, um, it's definitely attractive to them, but you're not going to eliminate the infestation. So I would say in your property, you might make it less heavy. Um, but they're just going to leave the tree of heaven and go to something else to feed on. So they're going to find a secondary host. Um, if you want to, I would say if you have the funds and the resources, you could consider having the tree of heaven systemically treated once it's later in the season, uh, maybe August, uh, once the flowers are all gone. And then in that way, the pea tree of uh, lanternfly that feed on it would be poisoned. Um, and luckily, there's not much in the way of native species that use tree of heaven as a food source once the pollinators are done with it. So that would be my advice would be if you want to maintain it for shade, go ahead. You could potentially treat it with a systemic insecticide um, or otherwise learn to live with lanternfly on that tree. If you want to get rid of it, the lanternfly will persist, but they will maybe not target your property as heavily. And then I'm sorry, mild winter. Um, mild certainly, winter. yeah, um, it has probably contributed to them coming out a little earlier. We didn't find the last infestation, uh, last hatch rather, last year until May 5th, I think. 
um, but also we we're going to have much greater survival of egg masses over the winter. So probably we're going to just see more bugs having survived. Okay, uh, let's see if I can squeeze a couple more in. I know we're at time here. Um, I serve on the board of a condo community. Our property is maintained by outside contractors. Many are not local to Montgomery County. Should we be requesting to see their copy of the permit? Um, they move their trailers, mowers, et cetera, from site to site. And yes. uh, actually related to that, uh, next question is, um, what are, what are, what are you, what is the state doing in terms of land, landscaping companies? It sounds like there should be prime targets for permitting. Will they comply? Yeah, so obviously compliance is going to be something we're always working on, but by the rules of the guy, or I'm sorry, by the rules of the order, anybody who is doing business also needs to know that their contractor or subcontractor has a spotted lanternfly permit. Um, we don't have the resources to go out and individually investigate whether or not a company has one other than being able to kind of bug them about getting a permit. Um, so I guess the best way to say it is, uh, yeah, for your condo community, they really should be asking for a spotted lanternfly permit um, so that this company is not transporting bugs inadvertently to your community. Um, and especially since Montgomery County's populations are so low, um, it'd be a shame to go and have just more bugs brought in from, you know, whatever other, you know, out of county job site these guys are working at. Um, if you want to give contact information and email it to us, we can always try and run them down. Um, you can also recommend to that company, go to our website, find the permit link and go ahead and get it. Um, as far as whether or not you continue to do business with them, that's kind of up to the individual person hiring the contractor if they want to go through with that. But um, by the terms of the order, it's a requirement. Um, in terms of landscaping companies, yeah, our big thing is trying to get out to pertinent industries and get them aware of the permits and get them permitted. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to go and gather business information en masse and get the message out. Um, so if anybody has professional meetings are always nice or good trade publications, those are nice to go and place permit ads into. But um, yeah, we are trying to get out to, um, uh, what am I thinking? Landscaping industry, um, transportation industry, all that. We want to get them all. So yes, to both questions. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Thanks, thanks for everything. Uh, Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kenton. That was a great presentation. It was a lot of information in a short period of time. We had great participation today from our audience. I know we couldn't get to all the questions, but we will package up any of the questions that went into our Q&A and forward them to you. And I'm glad you gave out your contact information. And I'm sure you're, uh, you will get to people that uh, reach out to you uh, directly. Uh, but most importantly, thanks for letting us all know how we can help with this problem. That was uh, very concise, and I stand ready to destroy some egg masses, stomp on some bugs, and do some reporting if I come across this, this path. Uh, so everybody, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be sending out a short quiz uh, via email about today's session for anyone who pre-registered if you're interested in receiving continuing education credits for the uh, American Society of Landscape Architects. And then we hope you all can join us for our next session of the Park series, Speaker Series in May. It is about Juneteenth and an upcoming Juneteenth Festival taking place here in Montgomery County. As you know, Juneteenth uh, commemorates the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans back in June 19th, uh, 1865, hence the name uh, Juneteenth. That's now a federal holiday. And we are going to be, uh, Montgomery Parks is going to be hosting and co-sponsoring an event called the Scotland Juneteenth Heritage Festival. So if you come back in May, we'll tell you all about that. It's going to be a series of uh, great events throughout the weekend that we hope uh, we'll get uh, many Montgomery County residents uh, participating in. But again, let me thank uh, Kenton and uh, thank you all for attending and uh, hopefully we'll see you in May. And that's a wrap.